This evening on The Rock Newman Show, 50 years ago, before half of all Americans were born, we witnessed the rise of someone who promised to bring the nation together in unprecedented ways. We'll take a look at RFK, his words for our times, with author Rick Allen and former ABC News White House correspondent Kenneth Walker. That's coming up right now on The Rock Newman Show. Welcome to The Rock Newman Show from the campus of historic Howard University in Washington, D.C. I'm Rock Newman, and it is my desire to inspire you with personal stories of extraordinary achievement. Like his older brother, President John F. Kennedy, Robert Kennedy was forged for leadership as the son of a wealthy political family in Boston. But it was during his time as a U.S. Attorney General that Bobby Kennedy became painfully aware of another America, and that was the world of the black, the oppressed and the poor. As a new political era gets underway, we'll go back in time to hear the words of Robert presented in a new book, RFK, his words for our times, compiled and edited by Rick Allen and the late Edwin Guthman. Rick Allen, welcome to The Rock Thank Newman you. Show. Thank, Thank you. you for being here. Your book, RFK, his words for our times. With the recent torrent of words that have come from the administration and leadership, so-called leadership of this country. It is so timely to be able to talk about this book from someone that I'm going to describe, you know, and I'm going to describe this in a way that we have when folks that look at the station, um, and then see our shows on YouTube and other places, there are what I call Facebook and social media revolutionaries. Huh. And no matter what you do in your life, it's sort of never enough. You, you, none of us are perfect. And neither was RFK. Correct. But these words of leadership, these words of compassion, these words of courage, these words of empathy, these words that this man spoke and the actions that he took are so diametrically opposed mm. to much of what we're hearing today, I couldn't wait for you to get here for us to talk about thank this. You. So again, thank you. L let me first ask how it was that you started this journey of mm. even being involved in this book mm. because it was a bit of a harrowing experience in itself in terms of the kind of time and commitment that you had to put into it, n having no idea that that's what you were doing next. Well, I, th I think you're referencing something that started out as fun, but this book was uh, actually in gestation a long time. I was 14 when Robert Kennedy was killed. He had the greatest impact in, on my life, mm -hmm. or probably anybody in my life. Mm -hmm. And so 25 years I, after. I, I want to stop you. Yeah. You were 14 <laughs> years old when he was killed, and you say that he had the greatest impact on your life. How and why? Robert <laughs> Kennedy described a vision of America that I felt comfortable living in and fighting for. And I think he exemplified a style of leadership which mattered not only in politics but in life itself. And as you said, he wasn't a perfect human being. None of us are. I never thought of him that way. Mm -hmm. uh, but I felt strongly as a kid uh, that that was the path the nation should walk down. And as you said in your open, we've really got two very different views of America. There's Robert Kennedy's view of America, and there's Donald Trump's view of America. And I think what 
midterm elections are about and what 2020 will be about is whose vision of America resonates most with Americans today. And I, ha I, have, I have my strong preferences. Yeah. So is something in, in, in here that, something in this book that just is a theme of people that knew him and you get it as a result of not just his talk, but his actions. And, it, and, and, and I think it is illuminated by somewhat of a humorous mm -hmm. event, somewhat of something <coughs> where people were looking at him like he was crazy, yeah. where, where the president, his brother the president, uh, sort of uh, following the lead of Theodore Roosevelt, yes. wanted to make sure that his uh, military, the Marine Corps, were able to do 50 miles, uh, that they wouldn't have the kind of fitness that would allow them to do 50 miles in three days and then maybe a day. Right. It, it reduced it down to a day. And some kind of way there was a challenge made yes. for Robert Kennedy to do it in a day. Yep. Which no one anticipated anyone in their right mind in the cold of February <laughs> would take off from, let me let you tell that story. Well, you're a absolutely right. President Kennedy had read this letter from Theodore Roosevelt to the head of the military back at the turn of the 20th century. And mm -hmm. the challenge was, could our soldiers and Marines hike 50 miles with a full backpack? Right. Uh, in a day. And the military rose to that challenge and it became a challenge that, that started rippling through the civilian world. This was just as John Kennedy was urging Americans to get off the couch mm -hmm. and get active and yeah. that's where the President's Council for Physical Fitness came in. But of course the President had a horribly bad back yeah. from his injury in the Second World War. He couldn't do it. Mm -hmm. But his brother, Robert Kennedy, then the Attorney General of the United States, could and felt he had to. So he gathered three friends around him, one of whom was Ed Guthman, my mentor and co-author in the earlier version of the book, mm -hmm. and said, all right, guys, we're going to do this. We're going to start from Potomac and walk. Potomac, Maryland. Mm -hmm. Potomac, Maryland, yeah. and walk up the canal all the way to Harper's Ferry. And there's a picture in the book. And for those who don't know for sure, Harper's Ferry, we're talking West Virginia. <laughs> yes, indeed. It is a long way. And so uh, there's a picture in the book of, of Ed and Robert Kennedy, and, and you'll notice a couple of things. It's February. Yeah. There's ice and snow on the ground. Yes. Robert Kennedy's wearing a pair of khakis. Yes. A pair of dress loafers. Loafers, yes. And essentially a windbreaker. Yes. And Ed, who was a decorated World War II veteran and right. one tough guy, yeah. at least has a winter hat on and looks a little bit more dressed for the weather. Right. But to make that long story short, Robert Kennedy did finish. Mm -hmm. None of the rest of them, including Ed, mm -hmm. made it. Mm -hmm. Ed made it to mile 30, yeah. and he said to his boss, yeah. uh, because he was the press secretary for Robert Kennedy, he said, look, I, I, I'm, I'm done, and I think you're done too. Yeah. It's dark. Yeah. This is before cell phones. There's no GPS. Yeah. There's no yes. race crew. There's yes. nobody helping us. Yeah. Why don't we? There's no press here. Yeah. Why don't we just go home? Yeah. And Robert Kennedy said, "You're lucky. Your brother's not president of the United <laughs> States," and went on and finished it. Yeah. Um, now, as, as someone who's been involved in athletics at some fairly high level, the part of what I saw out of that what could be described as craziness hmm. was a competitive spirit oh, yes. which seemed to have been ingrained in he and his family in, at a very early age. Yep. And that theme and that competitive spirit and a sense of righting wrong seem to be some of the cornerstones that yep. governed his life. No, that's, that's very true. And it was absolutely true for his generation. There were 10 kids, highly competitive family. Yeah. And it's go I now know his widow, his children, his grandchildren. 
That is just part of the Kennedy family makeup. Yeah. To be competitive, Robert Kennedy was a very, very tough guy. He, yeah. he burst on the national scene in his early 30s as the chief counsel to the Senate Rackets Committee. Yeah. And he was sitting about this far away from mafia chieftains yes. who had killed people yes. and corrupt labor officials, yes. interrogating them to mm -hmm. try to clean up the process in America and organize crime mm -hmm. and make labor unions what they're supposed to be for working men and women. You gotta be pretty tough. Yeah. That's not throwing red meat to your base. Yeah. That's going toe to toe with some very bad people. That's right. And that toughness then was blended with the empathy that you referred to, and it made it even more compelling because mm -hmm. nobody could say mm -hmm. he was a soft touch. Mm -hmm. one, of the, one of the morsels that I want to suggest to, to our viewers is to, I want them to recognize something out of the story of this, of this giant. And that is, there are a few people who were close to him, who identified something about him that he didn't feel that there was anything that he could not do, that he could not accomplish. There are, qu there are quotes about that. And there was a fearlessness to take on the most difficult issues, like you say, sitting this far away from mafia dons who would have you racked before dawn <laughs> and look them in the eye and go up against them. Not so long after that, dealing with Mc Eugene, Mc we're dealing with McCarthy yep. and taking on that challenge as a, as, as, a, as a young man, as a young rising politician, um, going to Mississippi, not just sending troops to Mississippi, but going to Ole Miss yep. and having conversations in the heart of Dixie when it was very dangerous, when people were dying and the governor and officials in Mississippi said, we can't guarantee your safety. Yeah. So he had a he had an exit ramp. But he's the kind of person that went anyhow. He why did he go? I think for two reasons. One, th there weren't votes there, but the need was there. And so he went because he thought it was important to listen to people where they lived and in the most desperate conditions in America. And he did that repeatedly, whether it was the reservations yeah. in, in Window Rock, Arizona, yeah. or the lettuce fields in Delano, California, yeah. or the coal mine areas in Kentucky and, and other desperately poor places around mm -hmm. the country and around the world. He felt that it was essential for him to understand, to be able to tell those stories to other Americans. Mm -hmm. So there would be appreciation for what their fellow citizens were suffering under, mm -hmm. whether it was race, class, or otherwise, because you couldn't bring the country together without that common understanding and empathy. So it was to hear, to understand, to learn himself. He was incredibly curious. Mm -hmm. And it was to communicate it in a way that helped to bring the country together at a time that was every bit as divisive as today's America. Yeah. You know, it, sh it strikes me, <clears throat> the, the, the dichotomy, it strikes me the juxtaposition of seeing someone running for the presidency that says, has his personal security to drag a Hispanic reporter out of a room, to say to his supporters, beat the hell out of him, get him out of here, I'll pay your bill. And then to know that in Nebraska, he was giving a speech and being just severely heckled. Robert Kennedy giving the speech, 
being severely heckled in Nebraska, and security came, not at his behest, but security came to lift him out. And he said to security, please, sir, that man has a right to do what he is he doing. Does. This is America. The police force would not listen to him and handcuffed him and was taking him out. And Robert Kennedy just on the spot said, sir, I promise you when I'm elected president, the first thing I'm going to do is to get you out of jail. Yeah. It, when, it was when, just a when different you, approach. When you, when you, when you, <clears throat> when you look at that, con at that contrast and examine what it means, these are tough times. You bet. Well, I, look, I will tell you, earlier, before that incident, when he was attorney general, he went to Japan. And he went to a university which was controlled by the Communist Party and the student body was controlled by the Communist Party. Threats on his safety. He walked through a, a heckling crowd, spoke, brought the opposition figures on the stage for a dialogue. Yeah. He did the same thing in Latin America mm -hmm. when eggs were thrown at him and his party. All of them, by the way, missed as they were walking through the center of that crowd. And he turned to one of his friends and said, if these folks are going to be revolutionaries, they're going to have to get a better aim. <laughs> they could never be on his football team. Right? <laughs> so, you know, it, it, it was personal fearlessness. And it was a belief in uh, the fact that debate on hard issues is the way you get to answers. Mm -hmm. You don't do it by shutting out another perspective. <clears throat> you are debating for that person's ultimate decision and for everyone who's listening. And you show respect to the opposite view, but you don't negotiate over basic principles. Mm -hmm. You can talk about tactics and how to achieve them, and you have to be skeptical about any organ of the government or any other mechanism to get to those results. So you want to hear differences of opinion. Yeah. But you stick to your moral principles and show respect to everybody you're dealing with. Yeah, and, and before, so before most of any of us knew anything about apartheid South Africa, this guy goes over. There were, there, there were some criticisms you bet. of what he didn't say, but the fact that he went and spoke sort of truth to power in a respectful way, because people wanted him to say, Oh, go out and, 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 and just go to war. Obviously, there, were, there was an understanding on his part that to have taken a different approach, a more aggressive approach, put people's lives, they would, have been exactly. sl they would have been slaughtered. But nevertheless, long before it became popular, he went there to address the issue of apartheid. June of 1966, yeah. government tried to keep him out. Yeah. They ended up not allowing any foreign reporters to accompany him. Yeah. And he barnstormed through South Africa, very much speaking truth to power. Ended up defying the ban that the government had put on the first African Nobel, Nobel Peace Prize winner, right. Chief Lathuli. Yeah. He went to visit him, banned way out in the country, yeah. and then brought back the message to the citizens of Soweto when it was against the law to breathe a word yeah. from a banned person. Um, it, an extraordinary trip. It, that is my favorite part of the book. Really? We, um, I had friends in South Africa who pulled all of the original English language newspaper coverage of that trip yeah. because it was completely revolutionary. Nobody was talking about overturning apartheid certainly in the American power structure, because it was the Cold War in 1966. Yeah. And as long as the government of South Africa was opposed to Russia, yeah. <clears throat> how it treated its own citizens was distinctly secondary. Mm -hmm. Robert Kennedy didn't believe that. Yeah. And so he went and engaged. Yeah. And I mm -hmm. had the chance to do it 30 years later with his widow yeah. and some of his children and grandchildren to speak on those same campuses yeah. and to meet with the breath yeah. South Africa ending up with spending yeah. half a day with yeah. President Mandela, yeah. who was in his second year yeah. as president. And that country has a long way to go, but has come a very long way. Yeah. 
Um, that was 1966. Um, obviously, 68 is, is when he met his very untimely death. Uh, long before that, there had been a relationship forged with um, perhaps the greatest civil rights, civil rights leader that this country has known, and that was Martin Luther King. Can you speak a little bit about their relationship? And then we have a video that we're going to we're going to go to that I think is one of the greatest speeches that a human has ever made. Thank you. I, I agree with you, by <laughs> the way. Uh, they had a contentious relationship, yes. particularly yes. early on. Mm -hmm. Robert Kennedy wanted to do right. He also wanted to make sure that his brother, the president, was protected in a political sense and, and able to advance policies because he continued to stay in power. And because of that, <coughs> there was always a tension mm -hmm. with Dr. King mm -hmm. about how fast, how soon, sure. and what the methods were. Mm -hmm. But increasingly, as Robert Kennedy was out of power and felt more and more strongly that America had to change, the two of them synced up in significant ways. And in fact, Marion Wright Edelman has told me that it was Robert Kennedy's suggestion to her, which she took to Dr. King, that the Poor People's March to Washington spotlight the circumstances of poverty in America. Mm -hmm. And that, he said, tell Dr. King you have to bring poor people to the seat of power mm -hmm. so they cannot be ignored. <coughs> but in Indianapolis, after Dr. King was killed, keep in mind that we, were, we didn't have cable news, it yeah. wasn't 24-7, yeah. didn't have cell phones. Yeah. Most people did not know the news. He was told as he was uh, getting on the campaign plane mm -hmm. to fly to Indianapolis that Dr. King had been shot. When he landed, he learned Dr. King had died. <coughs> He was told by the mayor of Indianapolis, Richard Luger, who went on to yes. become a United States senator, mm -hmm. and the chief of police, who had the unlikely name of Winston Churchill, <laughs> that uh, they did not want Robert Kennedy right. to speak right. in uh, the African-American section of town. Yeah, yeah. There in Indianapolis. In right. Indianapolis, right. in a public park, mm -hmm. because they said they could not guarantee his safety. Right. And, and he turned to John Lewis, now congressman and civil rights icon, who was an advance man for him in that campaign. And he mm -hmm. said, John, what do you advise? Mm -hmm. And John said, you have to go. Uh, these people don't know. When they find out, they will be heartbroken. It's important that you, as the most visible white politician, elected official, talk about your grief and find common ground. Robert Kennedy said he would go, sent his wife, who was pregnant, to the hotel. As he and John Lewis drove in, kind of crossed the border into the inner city in the Indianapolis, police cars peeled away. He had no support. Yeah. And he came on a, a crowd who was in a festive mood. It was a mm -hmm. campaign rally. Yep. He had uh, some notes that his staff had given him, which he never looked at. Yeah. You can see in the video. He's holding them in his hands. Mm -hmm. and, and what he proceeded to do was climb on the bed of this flatbed truck yeah. and speak from the heart, yeah. an entirely extemporaneous speech. And the results were pretty electrifying. Rick, we have that. Let's take a look. Could you lower those signs, please? I have some very sad news for all of you, and that is that Martin Luther King was shot and was killed tonight in Memphis. Martin Luther King dedicated his life to love and to justice between fellow human beings. He died in the cause of that effort. In this difficult day, in this difficult time for the United States, it's perhaps well to ask what kind of a nation we are and what direction we want to move in. For those of you who are black, considering the evidence evidently is that there were white people who were responsible, you can be filled with bitterness and with hatred 
and a desire for revenge. We can move in that direction as a country in greater polarization, black people amongst blacks and white amongst whites filled with hatred toward one another. Or we can make an effort, as Martin Luther King did, to understand and to comprehend and replace that violence, that stain of bloodshed that is spread across our land with an effort to understand compassion and love. For those of you who are black and are tempted to fill with, be filled with hatred and mistrust of the injustice of such an act against all white people, I would only say that I can also feel in my own heart the same kind of feeling. I had a member of my family killed, but he was killed by a white man. But we have to make an effort in the United States. We have to make an effort to understand, to get beyond or go beyond these rather difficult times. My favorite poem, my, my favorite poet was Aeschylus. He once wrote, Even in our sleep, pain which cannot forget falls drop by drop upon the heart until in our own day despair against our will comes wisdom through the awful grace of God. What we need in the United States is not division. What we need in the United States is not hatred. What we need in the United States is not violence and lawlessness but is love and wisdom and compassion toward one another. Feeling of justice toward those who still suffer within our country, whether they be white or whether they be black. We can do well in this country. We will have difficult times. We've had difficult times in the past, but we will, and we will have difficult times in the future. It is not the end of violence. It is not the end of lawlessness, and it's not the end of disorder. But the vast majority of white people and the vast majority of black people in this country want to live together, want to improve the quality of our life, and want justice for all human beings that abide in our land. With and what dedicate ourselves to what the Greeks wrote so many years ago, to tame the savageness of man and make gentle the life of this world. Let us dedicate ourselves to that and say a prayer for our country and for our people. Thank you very much. As we continue our conversation with Rick Allen on his book, RFK, His Words for Our Times, we're joined by veteran broadcast journalist, mm. Kenneth Walker. Ken is a former reporter for Nightline with Ted Koppel and that network's first African-American White House correspondent. Mm. Ken was also a foreign desk correspondent traveling all over Africa for National Public Radio when he resided in South Africa. Thank you for being here. It's about a I want to go back to you, Rick, uh, after, this, uh, after this sort of riveting speech in, in Indiana. And the following day, there are words that you want to share with us that were Absolutely. Said, yeah. America, the night of April 4th, experienced a tremendous amount of rioting, including here, here in, in Washington, D.C. Uh, and over 120 cities. Yeah. Indianapolis was quiet, and I think a portion of that is due to the message that Robert Kennedy brought in person. But the next day in Cleveland, he said this, and to go back to how you opened this segment about the difference between 
these beliefs and what we hear today. Robert Kennedy said, when you teach a man to hate and fear his brother, when you teach that he is a lesser man because of his color or his beliefs or the policies he pursues, when you teach that those who differ from you threaten your freedom or your job or your family, then you learn to confront others not as fellow citizens, but as enemies, not to be met with cooperation, but with conquest, to be subjugated and mastered. That is not the America Robert Kennedy stood for, and I think we'd be well advised to remember that. Ken Walker, your reflections. Well, uh, when you listen to that statement, uh, it's so redolent of the times we live in. We are living in times as perilous, in my view, as those when Robert Kennedy died. Uh, uh, in some ways, it's more dangerous because in the, in the seat of government, you have a man who is not compassionate, even as compassionate as Robert Kennedy, or even as thoughtful as LBJ, who passed some of the most important civil rights legislation. But a man who is weaponizing white supremacist grievance and deploying that in his own political battles, which is only definitely going to get worse as he comes closer to meeting justice. Mm -hmm. Now, when Robert Kennedy died, I was here living in Washington growing up. <clears throat> and at the moment of his death, I took note of it, but my world had changed two months before. Mm -hmm. Dr. King had been assassinated. Yeah. Many places of business and employment were gone. Yeah. Uh, many whole sections of town were burned down. Yeah. So I'm trying to get a grip on where I am yeah. and, and, and who's around me. What this all means. When Robert Kennedy died. Now I came to understand very quickly thereafter that his was perhaps the latest at that time in a string of political assassinations. Mm -hmm. We had the politics of assassination back then, probably beginning with JFK, but continuing through the COINTELPRO program, mm -hmm. and uh, with Malcolm, Medgar Evers, the Black Panthers, 16 of whom are still in jail, by the way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, this was the time that we were entering and that, that, that I was taking note of at the time of his death. Right. Why was it why was it important for you to share with us today? Why was it important for you to be here today? Well that whole era era is is important to me and actually the working title of my autobiography is The Class of Sixty Nine. Mm -hmm. That was the year I graduated from high school, and it was the year after the assassination of Dr. King, whereby a number of universities, police departments, municipalities, fire departments had affirmative action programs mm -hmm. to bring in African Americans uh, into, their, in, into their organizations. I benefited from that. Mm -hmm. uh, I, was, I had no financial prospects for college, but my counselor said, well, you've won some writing code contests. Why don't you go to Washington Star and ask them for a scholarship? Mm -hmm. Rock, I was way too young to know how ridiculous that was. Uh -huh. So I went. <laughs> and it turns out that they gave me an entry-level job and a full-time full -time scholarship. Huh. And so that whole era marked the beginning of my adulthood, the yeah, beginning yeah. of my professional career, yeah. and the beginning of many changes in America yeah. that uh, were to the good. So, I've talked about that time. I was 16. I was 16 when, 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 when Kennedy was killed. But I felt from maybe the 62 onward, mm. there was a dawning of a brighter day in America. And I felt that way for a long time, up till maybe the early 2000s, when I started to question whether or not that sun, that bright sun that was, I thought was shining and giving us a better day, 
it started to get cloudy. And I feel like now the clouds are really dark. And I felt like this for the last couple of years. I asked your friend and partner, Ted Leonsis, Rick, did he share my sense of concern? And Ted, who's the ultimate, you know, positive thinker, mm. didn't feel as if he talked about some things as to why it's still things were better and getting better. That was before Donald Trump got elected. And I ask both of you now how you feel about whether or not y y your sense of are you do you sense this same sort of gloom, if not doom? Anybody who uh, doesn't believe this democracy is in an existential crisis hasn't been paying attention. I am deeply concerned. I have grandchildren. I am deeply fearful for them and other people's grandchildren. You have people sending bombs to democratic leaders, shooting up synagogues, white supremacists running all over the country shooting black people. And that's not even the police who do it, but just civilian white people. Yeah. And, and it is possible to me, conceivable to me, that this country in its present form may not survive this period. There's a lot of work to be done. Donald Trump and white supremacists generally, there's an America they don't want to live in. Mm -hmm. And that was where you saw the sunshine. Yeah. They don't want to live in that America. Yeah. And I think left to them, they'll destroy it rather than go to that America. And so I think I'm, I'm seriously fearful. Yeah. So Rick, I would ask you, you travel in circles of influence. You travel in circles of, of, of affluence. Sometimes. <laughs> um, what, are, what are the folks that you rub shoulders with all the time? How are they feeling about this? Look, I, I, I think the threats you perfectly stated. And I'm a little bipolar about this because you have to be very frightened about directions that are pretty easy to track. But I think you also have to have optimism that there's a tremendous and rising groundswell to push back. And the question is, what kind of America do we believe in and are we committed to creating? Too many Americans have opted out of that question entirely. They are not participating in the future of the nation. Now, you can understand it because life, daily life is tough and people have to worry about putting bread on the table, taking care of their family, finding work that is meaningful and, and respected. But the fact of the matter is, Democracy doesn't work if people don't vote. And you're seeing, I think, great candidates rise, young people of both, of, of all uh, genders and backgrounds who are enunciating a vision of America that's closer to Robert Kennedy's and helping to create that in, um, in our current time. But voting and, is fine, Rick, but the voter suppression Yes. That's going on yeah. in many different forms yes. in a lot of different places. Mm -hmm. People determined to see that African Americans and young people and others, Hispanics, Native Americans, do not vote, or if they vote, their votes are not counted. Yeah. We, we, are, this, we haven't seen anything like this since before the passage of the Civil Rights Act, yeah. the Voting Rights Act, I mm -hmm. should say. Mm -hmm. and, so, and so, yeah, it'd be nice to vote and change democracy. But even that option is being taken away from us. Mm -hmm. And so I'm not sure where we go from there. Yeah. So Rick, I, I, I want to ask you as a, 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 you know, you've studied RFK as, as, as much as mm. anyone. You've, uh, you've written about him. This is, this, this is your book uh, with, 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 your, with, with your mentor. What, do you, what, do you, what have you gleaned from your intimate history of him that would frame your comments about what he would do now and what what would be your 
comments about what he would do now? Well, I think he'd do a number of things. And, and first, I completely agree with you about the voter suppression in so many parts of the country. I think Robert Kennedy would believe in the process of law and believe you have to fight to overturn that. We can get into a long conversation about what's happened to courts because of the appointment of judges at all levels, which is very troublesome. But I, we, we talked earlier about Robert Kennedy's toughness. Part of that may have been his faith or his fatalism, but he definitely never was willing to concede that the fight was over. He'd take it to the most difficult places under the most difficult circumstances and pay the personal price to do so. And I think it's incumbent on all of us to continue to push back, to be thoughtful and effective about how we respond, and to be able to distinguish between what we need to do to win elections and how we try to re-knit the country. And, and I think those are uh, very, very difficult issues to work through. But I, the reason I was so excited about bringing the book out now is that I believe his language and his policies and his history is relevant to us as a roadmap mm -hmm. forward, not mm -hmm. merely to look back and certainly not to look back with nostalgia. Mm -hmm. um, I did feel far more positive about many things when Robert Kennedy was alive, largely because he was alive. Uh, but it was a very desperate time. Mm -hmm. And I do think we have advanced. I think we are under attack now. And we have to think about what that means. How do we win when the rules are changing and changed on us to not be able to win? How do we continue to press through to win the contest that we have to? And then how do we bring the country back together in a way that is meaningful and once again marginalizes not the majority of Americans who believe strongly in the rights of every American, but again push back into the darkness. I'm not sure that's true. Forces. I'm not sure that a majority of Americans believe in the rights of all Americans. I am sure that a majority of white Americans are white supremacists in their heart. They believe that white people are better, that God intended it that way. Now, yeah. there are a lot of white people who don't. Yeah. But I, as, as judging from the results of the last election and the continuing support Trump enjoys today, you have to conclude that most, a majority of white people are white supremacists. So we have to engage this battle being clear about that context. Well, I would, I would advocate that the notion of, of uh, white supremacism is uh, or white superiority in any respect right. is f flawed biologically, historically, and in every way if you believe in America. I also am certain that there were many voters for Donald Trump who were not accepting that part of him. And I believe they've been uh, uh, surprised Maybe they shouldn't have been surprised, but I do not believe they are happy with that part of Donald Trump. And what I would say to you is, I have my view that the majority of Americans are committed to the right principles. Let's work together to put that to the test. We have to first put into office people who are clear not only of their basic morality and beliefs, but enunciate policy that can be implemented and that will be successful to move us forward because that's the, that's the critical element is to get the country moving forward again. Your notion of whether it's light or darkness is how many people are out moving in the same direction and what are they moving towards. And I, I, I fear for our country because it is undeniable that there is a bigger proportion of people than I ever thought possible who hold hateful views that are fundamentally un-American. And I think throughout our history, there's <coughs> been that group of folks. Yeah. But I do not think they're growing. I just think they have been unleashed to speak in public in a way that before was never tolerated. 
And I think we have to go back to an era when we restate why it's important to be an American and what that means relative to people who don't have voices for themselves and to the direction that we want to see the country. That's an American out. a lot of these white supremacists don't want to live in. I, I agree with you. Ken, I, I, I want to ask you a question. And Rick made a comment, or I think it was Rick made a comment, say we don't want to look at, we don't want to just look at Robert Ken Kennedy through the lens of nostalgia. But there was something that when he, and, I, and Rick, I want you to talk about how you deal with his de death in the book here. I remember as a, as an insane sports enthusiast, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, sports was my world, hearing a voice, and I think it was Rosie Greer's voice, saying to Rafer Johnson, the, the, the Catalan champion, Rafer, get the gun, Rafer, get the gun. There was a symbolism of that. There was, there was some symbolism that came out of that that was these two black men were there trying to support and protect this white guy. And that blacks in America have always lifted, has always lifted and been some of the best of what the so-called American ideals are. You were here. You were here in D.C. You said when mm -hmm. that when when that happened. Sure. Your thoughts. Your thoughts on 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 seeing and hearing that. Well, um, Robert Kennedy grew. Yeah. A lot. Mm -hmm. From the man who approved J. Edgar Hoover's surveillance of mm -hmm. Martin Luther King mm -hmm. and other black mm -hmm. leaders, mm -hmm. to the person by the time he died, mm -hmm. he was the most trusted white man in mm -hmm. Black America. Mm -hmm. He mm -hmm. grew a lot. Yes. Now. When I, when I look at the political scene today, I don't see anybody of that stature, mm -hmm. of that potential. Mm -hmm. All of us has potential, right. but I, I don't see that. And, mm -hmm. and, I, and I've been looking for it mm -hmm. ever since he died. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. uh, I spent 20 years uh, living in South Africa as the Africa Bureau Chief for National Public Radio. Yeah. I didn't expect I was coming back here. Mm. Now, when I did two and a half years ago to get a new kidney, basically, which I did get. You did what you did get? Yes. Okay. A number of African Americans in South Africa, and there are quite a few of them, mm -hmm. thought I had lost my total mind. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You're going back there. You're going back. What is on your mind? Mm -hmm. Well, in addition to having kidney issues, I had a daughter who was dying, mm -hmm. and three on the verge of adulthood grandchildren. Yeah who needed me, so there was no choice. Mm -hmm. I had to come back, and I still have to be here. Yeah. But having come back, it's like the twilight zone. Mm. You know, I'm back at a time when, in the middle of all this ugliness, yeah. um, which has no precedent. Yeah. This kind of ugliness did not exist uh, when I was growing up in Washington. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Didn't exist in the 60s, mm -hmm. 68. Mm -hmm. Uh, but it exists today, yeah. and it's heavy. Yeah. It's very serious. Yeah. I, I, I'd say two things about that. With respect to uh, other elected officials and potential leaders uh, rising to that level, I think the political process is such that when you're a party out of power, particularly out of the White House, You've got to get into a general election to have somebody have the same, same level of stature. And particularly with the way that Trump has manipulated the media to suck all the oxygen out of the room in terms of coverage. Um, I think there are many potential leaders for our future who have the beliefs uh, and the ability to communicate them and to get the job done. We just haven't seen enough of them to be able to say. But I also, I, I spent a long time looking for the next Robert Kennedy. And I supported and, and worked in many presidential uh, political campaigns. I, I'm of the belief that we can't wait for the next Robert Kennedy, that we each have to be Robert Kennedys in our own sphere. 
that we have to carry that torch personally and collectively because we aren't going to be rescued by an extraordinary leader. We certainly can't wait in hopes that will happen. The times are too dire. Um, and, you know, you and I are here for the 50th anniversary. We aren't going to be here for the 100th anniversary. And so we got to get the job done now. I think we can, and I think there are many people in elective life and coming into elective life who already have their shoulders to that grindstone, and we can push with them. Uh, a very wise person once told me that one of the most important things in life was to learn when to shut up because no words that I could express here as we try to wrap up would be as powerful or as important as those words. Uh, folks, this is going to wrap us for this evening. For more information on this program and any other program, go to whut.org, and we're going to ride out on the words of RFK today. Could you lower those signs, please? I have some very sad news for all of you, and that is that... Martin Luther King was shot and was killed tonight in Memphis. Martin Luther King dedicated his life to love and to justice between fellow human beings. He died in the cause of that effort. In this difficult day, in this difficult time for the United States, it's perhaps well to ask what kind of a nation we are and what direction we want to move in. For those of you who are black, considering the evidence evidently is that there were white people who were responsible, you can be filled with bitterness and with hatred and a desire for revenge. We can move in that direction as a country and greater polarization. Black people amongst blacks and white amongst whites filled with hatred toward one another. Or we can make an effort, as Martin Luther King did, to understand and to comprehend and replace that violence that stain of bloodshed that is spread across our land with an effort to understand compassion and love. For those of you who are black and are tempted to fill with, be filled with hatred and mistrust of the injustice of such an act against all white people, I would only say that I can also feel in my own heart the same kind of feeling. I had a member of my family killed, but he was killed by a white man. But we have to make an effort in the United States. We have to make an effort to understand, to get beyond or go beyond these rather difficult times. My favorite poem, I, my favorite poet was Aeschylus. And he once wrote, even in our sleep, pain which cannot forget falls drop by drop upon the heart until in our own day despair against our will comes wisdom through the awful grace of God. What we need in the United States is not division, what we need in the United States is not hatred. What we need in the United States is not violence and lawlessness, but is love and wisdom and compassion toward one another. Feeling of justice toward those who still suffer within our country, whether they be white or whether they be black. We can do well in this country. We will have difficult times. We've had difficult times in the past, but we will, and we will have difficult times in the future. It is not the end of violence. 
It is not the end of lawlessness, and it's not the end of disorder. But the vast majority of white people and the vast majority of black people in this country want to live together, want to improve the quality of our life, and want justice for all human beings that abide in our land. With and what dedicate ourselves to what the Greeks wrote so many years ago, to tame the savageness of man and make gentle the life of this world. Let us dedicate ourselves to that and say a prayer for our country and for our people. Thank you very much. This program was produced by WHUT, Howard University Television, and made possible by contributions from viewers like you. Thank you.